Welcome to some very famous people you've never really heard of. Bite-sized biographies of the famous, the infamous, and the quirky in less than an hour. My name is Philip D. Gibbons, and there is more information about me, this podcast, and a bibliography at someveryfamouspeople.com. There are also photographs of many of the individuals mentioned in this podcast. At the conclusion of part one of this presentation, there will be additional suggestions concerning further information about today's subject, Captain Al Haynes and United Flight 232. And as I've mentioned before, we are inching ever closer to the release of Is That Your Final Answer? Now let's get started with our story about Captain Al Haynes and United Flight 232. On Wednesday, July 19, 1989, at approximately 1.09 p.m. Mountain Time, United Flight 232 took off from Denver's Stapleton International Airport. The flight was headed to Chicago's O'Hare International Airport and was destined to continue to Philadelphia. The crew of the plane was led by 57-year-old Captain Alfred Al Haynes, assisted by William Bill Records, 48, with flight engineer Dudley Dvorak, 51. The three men had accrued close to 70,000 hours of flight time in their careers, and Haynes especially was highly experienced at the controls of a McDonnell Douglas DC-10, the aircraft making the flight. The additional crew was made up of eight flight attendants, serving the 285 passengers on board, the plane near capacity. For several passengers, Wednesday morning already was a typically hectic, unpredictable situation in which both summer tourists and business people jockeyed within a central hub of a major U.S. airline for oversold seating. One of these passengers, Jerry Schemmel, had arrived at the airport in the early morning hours intent on boarding a 7 a.m. flight to Chicago with a connection for Columbus, Ohio. Schemmel was the deputy commissioner of the Continental Basketball Association, a professional minor basketball league that was headquartered in Denver, the league's draft taking place in Columbus later that week. Schemmel was traveling with his boss, the commissioner, J. Ramsdell. Ramsdell, age 25, was the youngest commissioner of any league in the history of professional sports. His employment with the CBA started the day after he graduated from high school. Both Schemmel and Ramsdell were immediately disappointed to locate their flight on the departure screen, only to determine that it was canceled. The two men spent the rest of the morning attempting to stand by on ensuing flights, unsuccessful on the first two at 9.29 and 9.30 a.m., Ramsdell had a United VIP membership and was able to get on the 1055, and despite Schemmel's urging that he grab the seat, the commissioner declined and gave it up, not wanting to blow off Jerry. The two were all but confirmed for flight 232 at 1240 p.m., but some mundane drama ensued when a gate agent mistakenly gave away Schemmel's seat, possibly stranding him until late afternoon. Despite his frustration, the deputy commissioner kept his cool, and at the last minute he was summoned to the gate and presented with the final standby ticket. The two co-workers' whole intent on flying together was predicated on sitting next to each other, but now they were grateful to even make the flight. Schemmel was in 28F, Ramsdell in 30J. Based on how his morning had gone, Jerry Schemmel wasn't surprised when he got to his seat, only to find it occupied by a young child. The child's father courteously asked if perhaps Jerry could take his son's aisle seat, which was 23G, 
seven rows in front of J. Ramsdell. 23G was unoccupied, so Schemmel finally was able to get situated, the plane only minutes away from takeoff. Despite the crowded conditions, the flight had a festive atmosphere, many of the passengers returning from extended Hawaiian vacations. Additionally, there were 52 children on board, taking advantage of United Airlines' promotion that occasionally allowed a child to fly for only a penny. Four of these children were lap children, meaning they were seated with an adult, and many of the others were flying by themselves. It was a brilliantly sunny day, the two-hour flight to O'Hare not potentially facing any bad weather and turbulence forecast only as the plane approached the Chicago area. As a result, the chief flight attendant, Jan Brown, made sure that lunch was served as quickly as possible to anticipate that all of the equipment and necessities associated with meal service were organized and stowed well before the plane could potentially encounter difficulty as it neared its destination. The midday meal, described as a picnic lunch, consisted of cold chicken tenders, potato chips, Oreos, and fruit, the perfect airline food for quick distribution and retrieval. A video of Wide World of Sports commentator Jim McKay discussing the Kentucky Derby was transmitting via the plane's monitors. For approximately one hour, the flight was a perfectly normal, pleasant excursion with no indication of a problem. The plane, with registration N1819U, was put into service by United in 1974. Now 15 years old, like most passenger jets, the DC-10's engines, via maintenance, were a hodgepodge of various replacement parts installed over the life of the jet aircraft. Unusual in its design, the DC-10 featured an engine on each wing as well as another jet lodged in the tail. Unfortunately, the McDonnell Douglas aircraft, released in 1971, quickly became involved in several high-profile accidents that brought the model notoriety. Because of an innovative cargo door design that required sophisticated locking mechanisms, occasionally improperly engaged cargo doors would blow out mid-flight at high altitude. In June of 1972, an American Airlines flight over Ontario, Canada, lost its cargo door, and despite severe damage to the fuselage, the plane emergency landed without further incident and no fatalities. On March 3, 1974, Turkish Airlines Flight 981 was not as fortunate. This DC-10 crashed shortly after takeoff from Paris's Orly Airport, the pilots again victimized by a cargo door which blew out at 23,000 feet. In the ensuing crash in a French forest, all 346 passengers and crew were killed, at the time the largest air disaster in aviation history. Although the ensuing investigation, literally conducted by the U.S. Congress, necessitated fundamental alterations to every operating DC-10, major misfortune continued to dog the aircraft. On May 25, 1979, an American Airlines flight crashed only several minutes upon takeoff from Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Its left engine disengaged from the wing and fell back onto the runway. The plane, still airborne, climbed to an altitude of about 300 feet, but loss of the left engine forced it to bank sharply to the left, practically perpendicular to the ground. Damage to the plane's left-wing steering mechanisms rendered it impossible to maintain. The aircraft crashed less than a mile from the airport, killing all 271 aboard, as well as two employees at a nearby garage. As the flight was destined for Los Angeles, the disaster received nationally prominent coverage and prompted the FAA to recommend halting the plane's usage by international airlines and grounding all DC-10s domestically. Ultimately, the cause of the crash was determined to be faulty maintenance of the jet by American Airlines, and the DC-10 eventually returned to widespread use. Thus far, November 1819 Uniform, the unique identification name of the aircraft undertaking Flight 232, had operated without incident over the course of its 15-year service. At 3.16 p.m. Central Time, as the plane reached a position approximately 10 miles to the east of Cherokee, Iowa, that status would abruptly change.
the front portion of the rear-mounted jet engine known as the fan disc, a massive spinning rotor that essentially provided thrust and propulsion, suddenly split in two, not only sending shrapnel through the rest of the engine, but throughout the tail of the airplane as well. Passengers and crew, especially towards the rear of the jet, heard a loud explosion that was unmistakable and terrifying. Some of the crew, including Jan Brown, reacted instinctively. Walking down the aisleway of her assigned section, when the noise occurred, she immediately descended to the floor and grabbed onto a nearby armrest. Familiar with scenarios in which the fuselage had ruptured and rapid depressurization caused any nearby individuals to be sucked out of the airplane, she held on as tight as possible, waiting until the plane reached some sense of stability. Unlike the crew who responded deliberately as a result of both training and experience. The reaction of the passengers was vocal and apprehensive. In seat 23G, Jerry Schemmel heard the explosion, which ominously reverberated throughout the cabin. Immediately, he became aware of a sensation that the plane was descending, as if preparing to land. But Flight 232 was nowhere near Chicago, and Schemmel understood that this descent was abnormal and probably the result of the rear explosion. His apprehension increased when the plane continued to descend and the right wing of the aircraft began to dip, veering to the right perceptibly. Schemmel sensed that the plane might flip over at any moment. A sudden scream from a female passenger only underlined his fear that the flight was in serious trouble. As several children started to cry and other upset adult passengers were audibly sobbing, Schemmel began to sense that he was about to die and that he would never see his wife again. But, only a few minutes after the explosion, the plane gradually leveled off and seemed to attain partial stability. The engine sounded different, the plane occasionally shook and rattled, but the jet seemed to be under some semblance of control. Once Jan Brown sensed that the plane was not in any imminent danger, she got up and began to reassure some of the more traumatized passengers that everything would be okay. As she made her way down the aisle and attempted to look as nonchalant as possible, the plane's internal intercom rang at her station. She could see most of her fellow crew members who were clearly not trying to reach her, so she assumed that the communication was coming from the cockpit, a foreboding sign. She picked up and heard the voice of flight engineer Dvorak requesting that she come forward to speak with the pilots. As casually as possible, understanding that every passenger was keenly focused on her demeanor, she made her way toward the cockpit, knocking when she got there. When the door opened, Jan Brown was shocked by the body language of both pilots, desperately trying to maintain control of both the yoke or the plane's steering mechanism and the throttles which controlled the plane's velocity. Subsequent docudramas concerning Flight 232's ordeal have depicted this and other conversations within the cockpit as practically casual exchanges in which Captain Haynes breezily updated flight attendants or made suggestions to his fellow crew members in a casual exercise of trial and error. In truth, Jan Brown sensed immediately that the plane was in crisis and that the pilots were doing everything possible to keep the vessel from flipping over and plunging directly to the earth. Haynes did not have time for a detailed update, but he told the flight attendant that the plane had lost all hydraulics and she should inform the other crew members that the situation was serious and to prepare for an emergency landing of some sort. To Brown, it was clear that that outcome was optimistic and she was suddenly gripped by terror. And For the first time in her career, she wished she was anywhere but on this airplane. Nevertheless, she realized that for the sake of the passengers, who did not know how serious the situation was, she would have to hold herself together and continue to exude a calm exterior. Jan Brown might not have been able to do that had she been aware of the immediate aftermath of the explosion and the ensuing drama in the cockpit. Immediately, records grabbed control of the airplane while Haynes mechanically attempted to analyze the reason for the tail engine's failure. Only a minute after the incident began, records told Haynes that he was losing control of the vessel. Haynes could see that the co-pilot was attempting to steer the plane up and to the left, but the aircraft was descending and veering to the right, dangerously close to rolling over. Haynes also grabbed his controls, but for some indiscernible reason, the plane would not respond. Despite having never faced such a situation previously, 
Al Haynes reflexively took his right hand off of the yoke, pulled back on the left throttle, and pushed the right throttle to full power in an attempt to equalize the force pulling the plane to the right, an unprecedented response he performed instinctively. Just as Dvorak yelled, we're rolling, Haynes completed the maneuver. Slowly but surely, the craft responded and stabilized, a development that reassured passengers like Jerry Schemmel that the plane was not momentarily going to crash. Although an immediate crisis was averted, Dudley Dvorak now informed his fellow crew members of another baffling and dire situation. While Haynes and Record struggled to control the airplane, the flight engineer witnessed an astonishing development that appeared technically inexplicable. The gauges that monitored both pressure and the level of fluid in the plane's three hydraulic systems were sinking rapidly and inexorably to zero, confirming the plane's refusal to respond to normal steering commands from the cockpit. Unlike a small two-seater prop plane in which an airplane's flaps and wing steering mechanisms could be manipulated by hand, a jet aircraft required a sophisticated system of hydraulics that used basic physics and fluids to maneuver the airplane up and down, side to side, and even assisted the plane's braking and landing gear. Hydraulic fluid was delivered by a system of tubes to critical points in the airplane's fuselage that could apply pressure to lower or lift the wing flaps or move the tail flap from side to side. But based on what Dvorak was observing, all three of these systems were now completely inoperable, rendering the plane impossible to steer. While it was understood among pilots that such a situation was completely untenable, it was also believed that this malfunction, based on the airplane's design, was also a statistical impossibility. Perhaps one of these systems might and had on occasion failed, but the eventuality of all three failing was not only virtually impossible, it was a foregone conclusion that any airplane beset by this failure would inevitably and rapidly crash. This terrible prognosis was underlined when Captain Haynes instructed Dvorak to contact via radio United's Systems Aircraft Maintenance Unit headquartered in San Francisco. This group, nicknamed SAM, was a backup that provided real-time solutions to planes experiencing technical difficulties. The unprecedented nature of Flight 232's dilemma was underlined by this group's refusal to even accept Dvorak's description of the hydraulic situation. They merely kept asking him to repeat the plane's current condition, obviously bewildered that such an aircraft was continuing to fly. While the cockpit struggled to hold it together, another flight attendant became involved in a fortuitous conversation with one of the passengers in her section. Jan Murray had already been told by Jan Brown that the plane had lost all hydraulics. Two of her first-class passengers were United pilots, and one of them, Dennis Fitch, was actually a DC-10 flight instructor. He noticed that Murray seemed unusually distraught, and when she walked by his seat, he got her attention and tried to reassure her by telling her the plane would be fine on two engines and they just had to get to a lower altitude. The flight attendant leaned as close as possible and in the quietest audible voice told Fitch that both pilots were struggling to fly the plane and that we have lost all of our hydraulics. Fitch tried to contradict her, telling Jan that couldn't be feasible, but she was so adamant he suggested she tell the pilots that a DC-10 training check airman was on board and was ready to assist in any way possible. As she walked away in the direction of the cockpit door, Fitch figured that she was exaggerating or maybe hadn't correctly heard the specifics of the problem. But with the plane continuing to tilt noticeably to the right, Fitch, who dealt with mechanical problems on a routine basis, was definitely concerned. Jan Murray was also shocked by the atmosphere in the cabin. When Dvorak opened the door, the two pilots were clearly battling to merely maintain control. The sight so unnerved her that she blurted out that there was a training check airman in the back if they needed him. Al Haynes not only didn't hesitate, he didn't even turn around. Okay, let him come up, was his one-sentence response. Fitch also was not expecting the scene that he was confronted with when he entered the cockpit. He could tell by the white knuckles of both pilots and the position of the steering mechanisms that the situation was critical. A quick check of Dvorak's instrument panel confirmed that something was seriously wrong with the plane's hydraulics. 
The plane was also locked into a cycle of gaining and then losing hundreds of feet of altitude, much like a paper airplane that would initially rise in the air, fall to a certain level, and then rise again. Except this was a jet aircraft that couldn't possibly land while exhibiting this behavior. Al Haynes was hoping that someone with Fitch's experience would be able to supply a technically magical quick fix. But much like Sam back in San Francisco, Denny Fitch, after just taking a quick look at the instruments, was just as taken aback and had no immediate answers. Almost with resignation, both pilots suggested he take a look at the plane's wings to spot what was wrong. It only took Fitch a few minutes to casually walk back to the middle of the plane and observe that both ailerons, the flaps at the back of the wings that provided direction for the airplane, were sticking straight up, most likely pushed by wind velocity and impossible with normal hydraulics. Fitch explained what he saw back in the cockpit, confirming everyone's worst fears, but then told Haynes he would try to help him any way that he could. Haynes still didn't quite comprehend that the plane's controls were useless, but he decided to have Fitch take over the throttling process. Although a two-dimensional chart of the plane's flight path thus far would indicate a crazy circular pattern, in truth, the aircraft's trajectory was more like that of a corkscrew, which meant the plane was steadily losing altitude. Within minutes of the explosion, Dudley Dvorak contacted the nearest major traffic control operation in Minneapolis and requested the location of the closest airport to their current position. Minneapolis informed him that their best option was Sioux City, Iowa, which they had already passed, but was about 40 miles away. Minneapolis then handed off Flight 232 to air traffic control at the Sioux Gateway Airport. This airport was a military installation that served as a base for both the Air Force Reserve and the Iowa Air National Guard. The relevant controller on duty was 27-year-old Kevin Bachman, who, despite the distress description from his counterpart in Minneapolis of a large passenger plane in the midst of an emergency, was relatively nonchalant. Because of the military aspects of Sioux Gateway, any problem was reported as an emergency, so such a designation was a daily occurrence. Bachman identified Flight 232 on his radar screen, mentally noted the plane's loss of its number two engine, and relayed the pilot's request to have emergency units standing by on the ground. Bachman also informed tower management of the impending situation, who notified the FAA in Kansas City, who in turn notified the FAA in Washington, D.C. All of this occurred within minutes of Kevin Bachman speaking to Al Haynes for the first time. Suddenly, Bachman could hear the captain of Flight 232 in his headphones. Captain Haynes informed the controller of his current altitude, compass course, and the amount of altitude he was losing per minute, which in this case was 500 feet. Bachman responded with the weather, barometric pressure, a direction to reach the airport, and a potential runway. It was 3.28 p.m. Central Time. Four minutes later, although calm, Al Haynes spoke with Bachman again, leaving no doubt as to how serious the situation was. Sir, we have no hydraulic fluid, which means we have no elevator control, almost none, and very little aileron control. I have serious doubts about making the airport. Have you got some place near where we might be able to ditch? Unless we get control of the airplane, we're going to put it down, wherever it happens to be. It took Bachman a full 90 seconds to digest that and respond with a mere restatement of the airport's direction and distance. United 232, the airport's about 12 o'clock and 36 miles. During this exchange, Dvorak continued his own dialogue with the SAM unit that might have been comical were it not for the consequences of their inability to even grasp the situation. They kept asking the flight engineer to repeat that all hydraulics were lost, and finally, after almost 15 minutes of back-and-forth repetition, they could only dejectedly add that the crew was doing everything it could possibly do. While Bachman interacted with Flight 232, Flight Tower Management grappled with what kind of emergency response should be alerted. Alert 2 meant that there would be enough of an emergency response to handle a rough landing and a few minor injuries. Alert 3 meant a full-on mobilization of all emergency capability in the vicinity. Airport management would appear foolish if the plane landed without much drama, 
but the flip side of having dozens of seriously injured survivors without any medical assistance was an outcome they couldn't gamble on. Not only as a result of the airport serving as an outpost of the National Guard, but also because a well-rehearsed emergency plan was in place to rapidly summon fire and rescue vehicles from nearby locales, an exceptional network of rescue entities would be in place, awaiting the outcome of the plane's descent. Jan Brown began to spread the word among the flight attendants to get the cabin ready for an emergency. For the first time, the absurdity of having so many children, some completely untethered infants, hit painfully home. But all of the flight attendants began the process of informing passengers to remove eyeglasses and any sharp objects from their pockets. They also tried to explain to the adults involved that the best way to protect their small children in the event of a crash was to place them at their feet and surround them with pillows. Again, practically comical advice if the predicament wasn't so potentially threatening. Jan Brown withdrew from this process to try and update the cockpit. At one point, she managed to get a look out of some of the plane's rear windows at the horizontal stabilizer, basically the tail section underneath the now useless engine number two. The rear of the aircraft had visible damage that the flight attendant understood was critical. She knocked on the cockpit door for several minutes before it opened, the inhabitants completely preoccupied with the minute-to-minute process of keeping the plane airborne. Intent on updating Captain Haynes, the flight attendant didn't even get a word in edgewise before the pilot began to explain that they had lost all hydraulics. They were trying to make Sioux City and that he would signal her to evacuate, adding that most likely they would crash. Several times he used the phrase, it's going to be rough. Brown left the cockpit practically in tears and was heading down the aisle before she remembered the update. She quickly knocked on the door again and whispered the information to Dvorak. The flight engineer informed the aviators of the damage to the tail and asked if he should check it out. Betraying his resignation, Haynes told him to take a look and added it probably wouldn't matter anyway. It had taken Haynes and Denny Fitch 20 minutes to even introduce themselves. Fitch tried to lighten the mood by saying that they would all have a beer after they landed the plane. Haynes responded that he didn't drink, but after this he would sure as hell have one. Dvorak was just as grim as he made his way to the back of the plane, another flight attendant, Susan White, pointing out the visible spots where clearly fragments of metal from engine number two had lodged in the horizontal stabilizer. It was clear to Dvorak that engine number two had failed spectacularly, but that information was of little consequence at the moment. For Susan White, who knew Dvorak well after living in the same apartment building for three years, his unusually tense expression was as disturbing as the condition of the plane itself. Dvorak tried to reassure her, wished her good luck as he turned and headed back to the cockpit. White having to duck into a lavatory because she was afraid she would lose her composure in front of the passengers. Only minutes after the explosion, Al Haynes had gotten on the intercom and explained that engine number two was disabled, but that the other two engines would be more than sufficient to get the plane to Chicago, albeit at a lower altitude that would require more time. At about 3.35, Haynes decided to level with the passengers. I'm not going to kid you. We're going to make an emergency landing in Sioux City. It's going to be a very hard landing harder than anything you've ever been through. Please pay close attention to the flight attendant's briefing, and we'll see you in Sioux City. By now, Denny had figured out how to manipulate the airplane by varying the throttle on each engine. Left alone, the plane kept turning to the right and dipping at an angle. About 30 miles away from Sioux City, Fitch figured out how to make the only left turn attempted after the explosion, a turn necessary to even get Flight 232 anywhere close to Sioux Gateway. The plane was at roughly 9,000 feet and descending. Haynes asked what they should do with the landing gear, and it was quickly agreed that they should be lowered immediately, if only to slow the plane down modestly by providing resistance. On the ground, Bachman was nervous about several electrical towers in the airport vicinity that were over 1,000 feet tall. He wasn't sure about how maneuverable the plane would be. At 17 miles out, he told Haynes that he should alter his course slightly to the left to make the airport and also avoid residential areas of the city. Haynes then got on the intercom and gave the passengers a 10-minute warning and told them that his signal that they were about to land would be the repeated word, brace, 
the flight attendants had already instructed the passengers to either bend over and grab their calves or grab the seat in front with both hands and wedge their heads against the seat as tightly as possible. Bachman could see the direction of the plane on his radar screen and repeatedly tried to keep Haynes apprised of where he needed to be. At 10 miles out, the pilot and co-pilot still had not spotted the airport visually, smaller and narrower than a large metropolitan facility. Only two and a half minutes before the plane attempted to land, the crew finally picked out Sioux Gateway. Bachman mentioned the possibility of landing on a large nearby interstate highway, but Haynes, elated that he was even this close to the airport, brushed that idea off. Dvorak announced to the passengers that they were two minutes from landing. Bachman officially cleared Haynes to land on any runway, and Haynes jokingly replied, You want to be particular and make it a runway, huh? For Bachman and the rest of his fellow controllers and tower management, there was nothing left to do other than to wait for the airplane to appear and hope that the landing was relatively smooth. But, based on where they were 30 minutes ago, with no guarantee that the plane would even make the airport, they were in a lot better shape than could be expected, and Bachman was optimistic. The crew had already done a practically miraculous job of even getting the plane this close. But without hydraulics, even if they landed appropriately on a runway, their velocity was going to be a problem. With no controls and no brakes, their landing speed would be 250 miles an hour, twice what was normal. The good news was that the airport was surrounded by cornfields, and Denny Fitch figured, at the very least, that all of that vegetation would eventually provide a natural buffer that could slow and stop the plane. As the aircraft suddenly appeared over the bluffs around the airport, it was level and lined up perfectly with its intended runway. Bachman was so excited, he actually stood up in the control room and shouted, He's going to make it! At 400 feet of altitude, Haynes' biggest concern was that, because of the excessive speed, the plane's tires would blow out on impact. Both Haynes and Records yelled to Fitch to lower the speed as much as possible, but in a split second he decided that he wanted more speed, not less, afraid that the landing gear would collapse based on how quickly the airport was dropping in altitude. He attempted to, in his own words, firewall both engines to increase the throttles to maximum velocity. Whether he was unable to do this uniformly or whether the plane repeated the tendency that plagued the pilots throughout the flight, only a hundred feet above ground and a few seconds from landing, the plane's right wing dipped rapidly and precipitously, the tip of the right wing hitting the ground at about the same time as the right landing gear. It sheared off and cartwheeled down the runway, the fuselage breaking up as the horrified occupants of the tower watched a giant fireball engulf the widening circle of wreckage. Various pieces of the plane separated as the aircraft flipped over, much of the debris coming to a halt in the cornfield next to the runway. The emergency vehicles in the vicinity did not need to be told to head for the wreckage as quickly as possible. After a long silence, Kevin Bachman, in tears, got up from his work area and made his way into the tower's stairwell. He and his co-workers understood that very few passengers, if any, could have survived that kind of impact and inferno. Thank you for listening to part one of this podcast about United Flight 232. Much of the information for this podcast came from the books Flight 232, A Story of Disaster and Survival by Lawrence Gonzalez and Chosen to Live by Jerry Schemmel. There are also additional photographs, bibliographical and musical information at someveryfamouspeople.com. If you have enjoyed this presentation, please like us at our Facebook page, Some Very Famous People, and follow us on Twitter at Philip D. Gibbons. Also rate us on iTunes, and if you have the time, leave a brief review. A link is provided at the website.